Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to Ecology Lesson 2 out of 7. Uh, today we're going to be talking about food webs and ecological pyramids, which are actually very similar concepts. Uh, same like last time, if you could uh, only use your student lesson and fill it in as we go along, and maybe find someone to ask questions to or discuss concepts with as we go through. Uh, yeah, okay, let's begin. I'm going to share my screen with you. And we are going to begin on this PowerPoint. Okay, so on the left, what we have here is um, a food pyramid, and on the right is our food web. Okay, so today I'm going to teach you how I want a food web to get constructed and how I want it to look. And I think the day after I post this lesson or some within a day or two, I'm going to be asking you to create a food web in the form of a food web drawing assignment. Okay. All right. So here is what we know about ecosystems. Ultimately, there is an intricate balance, okay, between all the different species within an ecosystem. Every single species is influenced by the organisms, the predation, the competition, its ecological niche, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, if we were to take all the species out there and compartmentalize them into two major categories, what would you think those categories would be? You are either a blank or a blank in the simplest of terms. So, organisms are either producers, i.e. plants, and then, on the other hand, there are the consumers, i.e. animals. It's not as clear as plants and animals, but there you have it. Um, the producers are your autotrophs, your consumers are your heterotrophs. And today we're going to look into the different compartmentalization of the different types of consumers that are out there, okay? So what is the name for a producer that only eats other, uh, uh, only eats plants? What do we call that kind of, um, oh my goodness, let me try that again. What is the name of a consumer that only eats plants? What is it called? Herbivore. Then let's go into a type of consumer that eats plants and animals. They are called omnivores. And then a consumer that eats other animals only would be considered carnivore. Then there's two other kind of categories. Okay, there are the ones that wait to eat the decay or the remains of organisms. What would you call those? The prime example that we think of is your vulture. Okay, so it doesn't attack and prey and kill. It waits for the organism to die and then will feed on their <laughs> rotting, decaying body. Those are your scavengers. Then the last one, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's not actually an animal. This is where you will get your, your fungi, okay? Some insects act as these. What are these called? Okay, these are called your decomposers. And what they're feeding on is something called detritus. So the rotting, decayed organism, okay? So detritivore or decomposer. So those are your different categories. So let's take a look at the first definition on the next page. And what is it I am defining? An animal that eats producers is called a herbivore. Okay, the next definition is for an omnivore. So what goes in those other two blanks? Omnivore, an animal that eats both m mm and m. Mm. So your plants and animals. And if the third definition is for a carnivore, what goes in that blank? A carnivore is an animal that eats other animals. Okay, so the next definition is going to be for a scavenger. So what would go in the blank after that? A scavenger is an animal that feeds on the blank of other organisms. So this would be feeding on the remains, the decay of other organisms.
And the last one is their definition for a detritivore, okay, a decomposer. So what is this one feeding on? It's a little bit different than a scavenger, okay? So a scavenger is taking that, that dead body and eating it. But the detritivores, the decomposers are not, they're helping break down that dead body, okay? So what they're actually feeding on, their source of nutrients is the dead organic materials, soil, feces, the rotting matter, okay? And so certain examples, the fungi, so the mushrooms, things like that are your key examples of a decomposer. Um, and even beetles, certain beetles called dung beetles are even named after that because what they are feeding on is dung. And we need, so dung ultimately is another word for poop or feces, okay? Um, earthworms, so all of these things are required because in the last lesson, when I taught about biotic and abiotic, Remember how there is that kind of that fine line between when something is living versus when it's dead, but still considered biotic, but then at some point it becomes soil, which is now abiotic. So imagine the detritivores are, are creating that transition, that blurred line intermediate stage between a decay and the abiotic soil that it is turning into. Okay, so let's write some of these examples. So detritivore is a decomposer. What it's feeding on is organic materials, okay, so decaying matter, feces, Ugh, soil is one of those, again, tricky ones because within soil is some organic, some inorganic matter, okay, so it's kind of that blurred line already. And the key examples here that I want you visualizing are your fungi, okay? And then different types of insects, such as millipedes, beetles, earthworms, can do this as well. Okay, so if you need more time, feel free to pause at any point, okay? So just to hound it in, picture of a herbivore. And then on to our omnivore, which is us. Carnivores, some examples of scavengers, just so you know, hyenas, crows, hogfish, I don't know, some type of fish, <laughs> but vulture is the big one. Okay, all right, <clears throat> I want you to find somebody to discuss what is a niche. I'm going to tell you now, every single species has its own ecological niche. And in ecosystems, in order for it to be stable, niches do not overlap, okay? So in order for it to be stable and therefore sustainable over long periods of time, it all is in an intricate balance, but ecological niches are not overlapping here, okay? So pause the video, and I'm going to tell you it looks at three things. The ecological niche of an organism looks at three things about that organism. What could they be? Pause the video, discuss, and I will show you the answer. Okay, so the niche of a species is what function the species serves in the ecosystem. So that definition is convoluted and, and really doesn't help me understand the concept. So the key is the three things that we're looking at when we talk about the niche of an organism. You are looking at number one, what it eats. Number two, what eats it. And number three, general concept about how it behaves. Where does it live? What time of the year does it mate? Where is it found within the ecosystem? Is it in the, um, um, sorry, hydrosphere, uh, limnosphere, lithosphere, sorry, <laughs> okay, um, or different areas of the atmosphere and intertwined with the lithosphere, okay? So in grade 11, you're going to actually look at this concept of isolation between organisms. So the question about how you can look at an ecosystem, how could there can be so many species in there, and yet the competition isn't so fierce that, that they aren't all killing each other out, okay? So how do so many different organisms exist within one ecosystem? And it's called a concept of isolation, temporal isolation, 
different mating periods, spatial isolation, living in different areas of the ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things would go under the third one of how it behaves, okay? And you'll look into more detail about that uh, in grade 11, okay? All right, so I want you to discuss how is an ecological niche important? So when you are looking at ecosystems, how is it important? So this kind of relates to what I was just mentioning. Why is it important that species have a niche when considering the stability of an ecosystem? So pause and discuss. Please write some ideas down. Okay, so this just goes into what I was mentioning about since species have their own niche and they're typically, each niche is slightly different from every other organism in that um, community. So for example, each population in a community, in an ecosystem has its own niche and it doesn't typically overlap. Okay, so that is key. So since each organism has its own role to play in that ecosystem, this helps it maintain its stability to be sustainable and ultimately operate harmoniously, okay? To maintain a balanced ecosystem. So let's please write something about that, okay? First, the concept that each species occupies its own niche. So each population essentially has its own niche and no two niches are exactly identical. Even if they eat the same things or the same things eat it, the part about how it behaves, that will be different, okay? So because each species has its own role to play in this intricate network, that's how an ecosystem can be stable and balanced, okay? So feel free to pause to write the rest of it. And I'm going to go on to the next. So just another demo to help you kind of visualize it. So the niche looks at what it eats, okay? So you've got your seal eating its, I don't know, sardine or something, okay? What eats it? What do you think is gonna be the picture I put up next? What is going to be eating that seal? Think about it. What's my picture going to be? Yeah, what eats it? And then think about what picture would I use that you might typically represent for like seals and how they act, how they behave, and how it behaves, okay? So where it spends its time, um, ultimately how it's acting, okay? When it mates, where it lives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm sorry if there is any background noise. It is currently pouring against my window. So I'm sorry if that is, uh, if you guys can hear that. Okay, spend a minute. Please discuss what would the ecological niche be of this black bear? Okay, so let me think. Uh, what it eats, let's say berries. What eats it? This black bear, huh, it actually might be what we call a top consumer. If nothing else eats an organism, even if it's a herbivore or an omnivore, it can be considered a top consumer, uh, at the, kind of at the apex level of a food chain, okay? And how it behaves, you have your hibernation, uh, foraging, etc. okay? All right, so now let's look at how we can represent feeding relationships. So what we started off in the lesson is talking about the different niches, okay, different categorizations of organisms, but now let's look at how you represent these feeding relationships. So what would it be called when you organize kind of a diagram to show what an organism eats and what eats that organism? Side by side or even up is called our food chain, okay? So. This is one way that you can represent the feeding relationship, okay? The most basic one is a food chain that is not actually accurate in nature. There are hundreds of food chains all put together, creating an interconnected food web, okay? And that is what I'm gonna be teaching you today, how to draw. 
So a food chain, a sequence of organisms, each feeding on the next, showing how blank is transferred. What is transferred? What is being represented? The blank from the plant is being transferred to the insect and the blank from the insect is being transferred to the mouse. What is that word? So energy. Okay. Notice how the food chain of the owl is organized. First comes your producer. Then second, you will have second, third, fourth, whatever. They are all now considered consumers. But the second one will be your herbivore. Third, you might have an omnivore coming <clears throat> or flat into a, con uh, or a carnivore. And keeping in mind the end of this, whoopsies, sorry, the end of this food chain is a carnivore, but that not that is not always necessary. Remember what I said about um, if nothing else eats the organism, it can be uh, an omnivore at the end as well. Okay. All right. So what is that arrow representing? The direction of the arrow represents what? The direction of the arrow represents the direction of energy transfer. So the one thing when you do your, your assignment, the one thing some people do wrong is they point that arrow the wrong way. I want the arrowhead pointing towards whichever animal got the energy. Okay. So the energy from the plant went to the insect. Therefore the arrow must be facing the insect. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we're going to talk about a concept of energy and how it's transferred. So, all right, so the squirrel eats the pine cone. Sure, it digests it, whatever, lives its life. And then the weasel comes to eat the squirrel. Does the exact same amount of energy in the pine cone get transferred to the weasel when the weasel eats the squirrel? Yes or no, pause discuss it, write your ideas down. The squirrel eats a pine cone, and then a few days later or a month later, the weasel eats the squirrel. Does the weasel consume the exact same amount of calories um, from the pine cone that the squirrel did? Okay. So this is called this concept of 10%, okay? Energy transfer. In order for an organism to stay alive, okay, most of the energy that it consumes is used to maintain its daily biological processes and functions of staying alive. Excess energy is released as heat, okay? So only a small portion of the, of the pine cone calories go into the meat of the red squirrel, the body of the red squirrel. And the weasel, ultimately, it's only the meat of the red squirrel that is left in the calories of the pine cone that have made its way into the weasel. So theoretically, the number that they say is transferred is about 10% of the pine cone's energy, okay, gets transferred when the weasel eats the squirrel, okay? All right, so a small fraction of the chemical energy that was stored in the pine cone makes its way to the goshawk. 10%, 10%, 10% at each level. So let's say the pine cone has a, <laughs> this is inflated numbers, but the pine cone has a thousand calories. By the end, about 100 of those calories make up the red squirrel, meaning 10 of those calories go to the weasel, meaning one of the calories makes their way to the goshawk. Okay, so 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%. So when you wanna look at how much of the pine cone um, the goshawk actually has, it would be, one calorie of the thousand. Okay. Okay. So again, this is going into the same concept one more time because it's a little, it's a little harder to understand when you start to quantify it. Um, but I hope that you do get the basics that the majority of the calories that we eat are used simply to survive rather than for growth and for the structure of our actual the meat of our bodies. Okay. Okay, so again, we're doing the same analogy, but we're pretending it's 100 calories. So think back to our photosynthesis lesson. We eat the sugar, 
and we're converting it into what? What does our body convert that sugar into when we eat it? So we convert it into ATP. So whether it's a protein or fat, all of our body has the ability to transition between the different states of chemicals to ultimately get ATP out of it, okay? Sugar is typically the one that we focus on because it is um, just very quick and easy, okay? Okay, so most of the calories were used to keep the organism living, moving, etc. A small fraction is utilized to maintain the meat of that squirrel or the body of that squirrel. That is the part that I want you thinking about, about what's getting passed down, okay, to the next organism. So realize, it doesn't matter what level of the food chain you go to, energy is always lost. So we're gonna look at later in this lesson, something called the pyramid of energy. That will always be shaped like a pyramid. There will be less energy transferred, less energy transferred, less energy transferred. So 10%, 10%, 10%, 10% from the original base, okay? So realize, since all organisms are using up the energy they obtain by eating other species, uh, when they perform their daily activities. So energy is continuously being lost from every level of the food chain as the organism continues to survive. Okay, so um, we looked at a food chain, but all you need to do is take those organisms and place them vertically upwards, and now you have something called a food pyramid, okay? So uh, you might see a food chain represented in the form of a food pyramid as well. Okay, so food pyramid. Take your food chain that was representing energy transfer from left to right and now stack it on top of itself from so that it's bottom to the top. Every single layer is going to be called now a trophic level. Okay, so every position, the base position, first trophic level, second trophic level, third trophic level. So I want you on the next slide to convert the pine cone food chain into a food pyramid. So first, I want you to write first trophic level, second trophic level, third trophic level. Then I want you to decide what kind of an organism is it? Is it a herbivore, an omnivore, a producer, a consumer? Okay. Then write down which organism it is. Is it the pine cone, is it the squirrel, the weasel, or the goshawk? And then there's one more thing between a primary consumer, a secondary consumer, and a tertiary consumer. Okay, so ultimately the rule of thumb is herbivores are primary consumers. Whatever is on the third trophic level is your secondary consumer. What is on your fourth trophic level is your tertiary consumer. So there should be three to four things in each section. So here you go. Pause the video because I'm going to take it up in a mere moment. Okay, so now let's look at our table, our pyramid. Oh, no, oh, it's going reverse, yikes. All right, let me just click them all and here we go. So first trophic level is where your producers are found. Notice there's no primary producer, secondary producer, just producers, okay? That would be your pine cone. Then we get into our second trophic level. These are called your primary consumers, your herbivores. This is your squirrel. The third and fourth trophic levels, whether they're carnivores or omnivores, sometimes there are different types at each level, okay? But these are called secondary consumers. That would be your weasel. And the fourth trophic level are your tertiary consumers, your gosh hawk, okay? All right. Okay, so this is another way, another type of um, a pyramid that we can use to represent the same concept, okay? All right, so now this is something I've mentioned before, but realizing that food chains are not actually accurate in nature, it's, not, it's just one piece of the puzzle of the more complicated food web, okay? So now let's focus on that instead. This is the, one of the best ones I could find online. 
I'm going to use the protocol that they teach in the textbook. <laughs> you go online, you're going to see all these crazy drawings and no, um, oh, I don't know, there's no organization to the chaos. So I'm going to get, I'm going to teach you to draw it in a way that looks somewhat like this one. Clear trophic levels at every row. Okay, nicely spread out, clear arrows. So I want your diagrams at the end of this lesson and in your assignment to look very similar to something like this. Okay, so notice at the bottom are your producers, then you have your cons primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. Okay, the key concept being that at the top, I actually don't care what's up there as long as nothing else eats that organism, even if it's um, omnivore, okay? Okay, so a food web is simply a series of interconnecting food chains. So please write that. All right, how do we draw one? Step one, easiest part, place all blank at the bottom. And this is due to the fact that blank are always at the bottom. So what are you putting at the bottom? Producers, evenly spaced apart, please. Next, these will always go in the second row. What will be found? It's your primary consumer, which is what type of organism? I want all of your herbivores in the second row. These are your primary consumers because they're always, if you're a herbivore, by definition, you are only eating producers, so therefore you should be second. The third and fourth is where it gets a little bit um, blurry, I guess, depending on if another organism eats it or not. Okay, step three. Now, omnivores are typically found in the third trophic level. So they can go in the row above the herbivores unless they are a blank, which is the, the word that I give for an organism that is, that is eaten by blank. Okay. Omnivores can go in the third trophic level above herbivores. So in that third row, unless they are what we call a top consumer, meaning they're eaten by nothing else. If it is a top consumer, place it at the top. I think I'm hounding this point in. Clearly enough, you guys are fine. You're probably ready and bored to go on to the next. Okay, then of course, what goes above the omnivores and the herbivores? Sometimes you can have two rows of carnivores, right? Um, if a carnivore is eaten by other carnivores, it needs to be on one layer down. If the carnivore is eaten by nothing else, it needs to be above the other carnivores, okay? And last time I'll say this. Any animal that is not eaten by anything else can be placed at the top. And then last thing, of course, represent the feeding relationships with an arrow to connect the species. Don't forget to put the arrow in the right direction. The arrows should be facing up because the energy from the organisms is being delivered to the one above it that is eating it, okay? So before you draw arrows, you have to ask yourself, does this species actually eat that species? another nice way of drawing it of course there's issues here there's no arrows okay <clears throat> but then the question that everyone has and I'm going to try to be clear about this when it comes to decomposers or scavengers I will be flexible about where you choose to put them unless I in the homework tell you a clear distinction and I say scavengers eat this and this but specifically decomposers, they are used to decompose everything. So I'm gonna show you a few food webs and show you the different ways that this was done. Um, and I'll be pretty flexible. Okay, so a detritivore decomposer, where would you put it? I'll accept a variety of options as long as they make sense. Okay, so take a look here, decomposers, they just put them in the middle. Eh, it's not the best way to do it. Uh, this one's kind of nice. Um, notice the arrow direction is changed. The arrow must always go towards a decomposer because the decomposer is getting the energy out of those. So even if the grass is at the bottom, whatever um, arrow is hitting a decomposer needs to be going towards the decomposer. I've also seen it kind of like this, kind of outside of the web completely. Okay, 
but ultimately I want it somewhere in the food web if I mention them, if I mention decomposer and the arrows need to be going towards them. Okay, this is another way that it was also done. But it was kind of, mm, it's kind of just clumping them all together, which we know if there's decomposers truly being considered, I want some arrows towards them. But this is a nice food web that it's, um, you can tell that they've really set it up nicely into those different trophic levels. Great. Okay, try it yourself. Okay, you are going to make a food web. Here's what you know. So this is how I'm going to set up your assignment. I'm going to give you an animal and I will tell you what it eats. You don't even need to know if it's a carnivore, an omnivore, a herbivore. It will be implied when you find out what it eats. So our weasel eats a squirrel, thereby being a carnivore. The grass is a producer, as you know. The snowshoe hare is a herbivore, but keeping in mind that it needs to eat the pine, the blueberry, the aspen grass, okay? The aspen and the grass, sorry. The goshawk is a carnivore. But the only thing that it's eating should be the snowshoe hare, the red squirrel, and the weasel. The great horned owl is also a carnivore. I only want it eating squirrel, snowshoe hare, goshawk. The blueberry bush is another producer in this food web. The pine tree is another producer, aspen tree as well. Then you've got your red squirrel, which is a herbivore, but it doesn't eat all of the plants. I just want you to show me it eating the pine tree. And then you also have a lynx, which is a carnivore, but it's only eating the snowshoe hare and the red squirrel. So please don't get too caught up on if it's a herbivore and omnivore. Just place them relative to one another in their feeding relationships. This should take you a few minutes. Please pause the video and I'm going to take it up. Okay. So hopefully you paused it. Now, this diagram is from the textbook. It's not ideal to me. I am hoping the way you did it was five trophic levels. That is the most accurate way to go here. So definitely, um, uh, you definitely have trophic level one is your pine tree, blueberry bush, aspen tree, tree, and the grass. Okay, trophic level two, I wanna see your squirrel, and your hair. Okay. Then in this weird almost in-between level, you've got the weasel eating the squirrel, which is also eaten by the gosh hawk. So so I actually want weasel to have its own trophic level. Okay, so it should not be in the same trophic lo level as the squirrel because it's still eating the squirrel. And even though the gosh hawk eats both the squirrel and the weasel, because the weasel eats the squirrel, it is in the trophic level above the squirrel. Okay, so now what do we have? You have goshawk, lynx, and owl, but the thing is, the lynx is eaten by nothing, the owl is eaten by nothing, but the goshawk still is eaten by the owl. So your fourth level should have the goshawk in it, and the fifth should have your lynx and your owl. Okay? All right. Um, okay, so I want you to take a look at these two food webs below. And which one would be more stable and why? So it's quite obvious here. The left one, if you take one organism out of this food web, it's going to essentially collapse the food web. The one on the right, there's so many organisms just to pick from that you can remove one and everything will still be fine. So the, the rule of thumb is this, the larger the food web, the less of an impact it has if a species is removed or even if it is added. So a species we're going to talk about in another lesson can be added is if it is an invasive species introduced by humans intentionally or accidentally. Species obviously are getting removed during the mass extinction crisis. Okay, now let's demo it. I want you to draw your food web from before again in the next slide, but now remove the red squirrel. What changes must be made? Okay. So pause, remove the red squirrel. 
And I want you to also think about the, the different numbers, like which organisms are going up as a response, which organisms are going down as a response. In your assignment, I will be asking you questions like this to analyze which organism is the most detrimental to remove. Okay, so remove the squirrel and look at the domino effect it has on the other organisms. Please pause and I'll take it up in a minute. Okay, here we go. Sorry, the animation is off. So let's start. I'm hoping the squirrel is cut. Okay, good. You kill the squirrel. The first thing you should notice is the squirrel is the only food for the weasel. So weasel is officially gone, okay? Squirrel is gone, weasel is gone. Okay, now let's look at what else is affected. So in effect, the gosh hawk can only eat, um, so, so the gosh hawk, eats the weasel and the squirrel, and they're both gone. Meaning the only thing it can eat now is the hair. So it has one third of its food source. Gosh hawk numbers go down. The great horn owl, all it eats is the gosh hawk. If gosh hawk numbers are going down, great horn owl, owl numbers are going down as well, right? And he now, if the gosh hawk is going down and the snowshoe hair is eaten by the gosh hawk and the lynx and their numbers are plummeting, hey, the, the, the snowshoe hare has, can increase in its numbers, okay? Because it has less predators now. The lynx is a tricky one. Yes, it has no squirrels to eat, but it also has more snowshoe hares. So this is where everyone starts to get a little ugh, confused because everything is interconnected. So you bring one up, it drives the other down, and everything ultimately does start to balance itself out, okay? But I do want the key of the squirrel being gone, making the weasel be gone, making the gosh hawk go down, making the owl go down. Okay. Please don't take it to the level of the producer because you know what, that gets a little finicky. But yes, you of course can analyze if there's more snowshoe hairs, there's going to be less grass because they're eating all of it. But eh, that's not exactly that accurate. There's a great abundance of a lot of producers out there in nature. Okay. So please don't get too caught up on all the finer details, okay? The main domino effects are the ones that I want you to look at. Okay, now we're going to look at an ecological pyramid. So it's like a food pyramid, um, but it's analyzing um, the number of species, the weight of the species, and the amount of energy of the species at each trophic level. So ecological pyramids. So it's looking at the relationship, but it's looking at a specific factor, whether it's the number or the weight or the energy. So the three types are a pyramid of numbers, a pyramid of biomass, so that's the one where I'm talking about the weight, and a pyramid of energy. So a pyramid of numbers literally writes down the number of each organism that is found in that food chain or food web, okay? And yes, in one of the worksheets, it starts to get a little tough. Like you, you want a general accurate proportion, right? If you have 10,000 blades of grass and 1,000, I don't know, snowshoe hares eating it, the snowshoe hare should technically be only 10% of the size, right? But sometimes it is hard to draw the, each block proportionately sized. So a pyramid of numbers, you create it by counting the number of each organism at each trophic level. So count the number of organisms at each trophic level and try to give it an appropriately sized bar to represent how many there are. Now, this one typically is shaped like a normal pyramid. There are more producers than there are herbivores, than there are omnivores, than there are carnivores. So typically, it is shaped like a normal pyramid. There are less and less species at each level up. So I'm going to show you what I mean now about different block sizes. So I want you to draw the next diagram on your slide, please. So this is called a pyramid of numbers. At the bottom is your number of producers. 
So 10,000 primary consumers, 1,000 secondary consumers, maybe, I don't know, 100, and then maybe 10 tertiary, right? Now, but what's a little more complex than that are that in nature sometimes, this can actually look like an inverted pyramid. But there can be more in the higher trophic levels than the lower. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a clear example here because sometimes it's hard to imagine how in nature there could be less of a producer than there is of a consumer. Here is the hint. Think about a producer that is huge, such as an oak tree, okay? And then the number of insects that can live in that one oak tree, this is where your pyramid of numbers might be skewed, okay? Okay, so this one here. Um, so for example, uh, this one, uh, the diagram on the bottom, I want you to look at. One oak tree, huge number of caterpillars that live on that oak tree, a uh, small number of blackbirds eating on that. And then uh, another type of bird, I think it is, yeah, that eats on the blackbirds. You see that this doesn't actually look like an accurate pyramid, okay? It's an inverted pyramid. The one here about again, you've got your oak tree, you have your insects on the tree, and then the birds that eat those insects. That would be an inverted pyramid of numbers. Okay, so now let's go into a pyramid of biomass. So biomass essentially is the biomass, the total mass of the living organism, okay? So per unit area, if it's terrestrial, so land-based, or volume, if the organism is aquatic. So you're actually looking at it in an area. So you're given a certain area and you're comparing the, the amount of mass of different types of organisms in that area. So what about this pyramid? Would it look like a normal pyramid shape or inverted or just have no regularity to it? So the rule of thumb is this. If most pyramids of numbers are shaped like a pyramid, then that means most ecosystems have more producers than primary consumers, than secondary consumers, than tertiary consumers, which would go hand in hand with meaning that the more producers there are, the heavier they are, the more weight there is, okay? So since there are fewer species at each trophic level, it should go to reason that the mass of these species will also decrease. So please write this down. And again, keeping in mind that biomass is a calculation that you need to do with regards to a certain area of land, if it's a terrestrial organism, or volume of water, if it's aquatic. So let's write that as well. So feel free to pause if you're not done. Okay, so you're calculating it by getting, adding the total mass of all the living organisms. Okay, so wh wh whichever organism you're looking at, add their mass, and then divide it over the volume of area that you're comparing for each organism, right? So this should again be typically shaped like a normal pyramid, okay? Since a pyramid of numbers is also typically shaped like a normal pyramid. Okay, feel free to pause if you need more time. And now let's draw the diagram, okay? So again, big block to represent biomass of producers, smaller block for the biomass of primary consumers, smaller block, smaller block, smaller block. So the biomass uh, pyramid the most common place you're going to find it in, in an atypical or inverted pyramid form is with uh, regards to aquatic life, okay? So when it's actually the volume with aquatic life, okay? So now the thing is, 
I'm sorry, let me just go to here. This example here of um, phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish, and then larger organisms, this actually would face uh, an inverted pyramid scheme, okay? Sea lion, herring, zooplankton, phytoplankton. This typically exhibits is as an inverted pyramid of biomass. Okay, and now we're going to go into our last pyramid, and I want you to discuss. This is a pyramid of energy. Okay, so I'm going to ask some questions and just kind of discuss it either out loud to somebody or quietly in your own mind. Okay, so what does it measure? I think you kind of know. Okay. What is going to happen from trophic level one to trophic level two to trophic level three? What will the shape be of this pyramid? Okay, so again, these are the pyramids that no exceptions are always shaped like a regular pyramid, okay? Because at every single level, no exceptions, only about 10% of the energy actually gets transferred up the chain as it's ingested because the other 90% was used and essentially wasted or lost to the environment to maintain biological processes or released as heat, okay? So as mentioned before, energy is always lost from one trophic level to another, whether it's through heat or energy or to power cellular activities. Okay. Only a fraction is transferred. That fraction is a 10% value. Um, so for example, I mean, I tried to research the actual values for how much a chicken would eat and how many calories are in a chicken. It's not a pure science, but if you imagine that it's eaten whatever, 10,000 calories I want you, in its lifetime, the calories it takes to actually eat it okay, would not be the same amount that it is eaten throughout its whole life. Right? So only about 10% is transferred to the next trophic level. So therefore, it is always shaped like a pyramid. Okay? So it's looking at how energy is lost and transferred between levels. So again, if you could draw this. Okay, so the energy of the producers, the energy of the primary consumers, et cetera, et cetera. And this one, I mean, this one gets harder and harder to draw because if you have 10% of 10% of 10% of 10%, it becomes almost impossible to draw it accurate, accurately proportioned. So when you do those practice for fun worksheets, I will be okay if it is not 100% accurate, okay? All right, so this diagram really helps clearly represent it. It's also from your textbook. Uh, just showing again, these waves of red are energy loss to the environment. Okay, so quite a distinct difference between each level. Okay, so last explanation. So, why? So, same thing with plants, they're using the solar energy to do photosynthesis, but some of this energy is needed to, for cellular respiration, right? So they can make all this sugar, but you can see it even in photosynthesis. If a plant absorbs all this sunlight and it makes all this sugar, and then the next thing it does is it takes this sugar and delivers it to the mitochondrion to use it and break it apart. It's the pure kind of the purest example of any energy that is absorbed is right away used, right? And plants being the clearest example. So then when the herb herbivore eats it, only about 10% of that plant's sugar got transferred. And so they'll use it to grow and reproduce, but only about 10% of all the food they've eaten maintains the body that they have, okay? And because they're using it up in life activities, only about 10% actually transfers. Therefore, a pyramid of energy will always be shaped like a pyramid. So I've handed this point in multiple times. So feel free to pause, take notes, but I think it's quite clear. So let me show you um, one example. I'm going to go with the aquatic example of the sea lion, herring, zooplankton, phytoplankton. Uh, just to show you that it, this one is possible to sometimes be inverted in every case except for energy. All right, so if you take a look, let's do our usual one we can visualize. Grass, rabbit, fox. 
there is way more grass than there is rabbits, way more rabbits than there are fox. That makes sense. Again, biomass, because there's so much grass, it does way more than the rabbits. Because there's more rabbits than foxes, they weigh more than the foxes. Fine. Pyramid of energy, yep, 10%, 10%, 10%, that makes sense. Okay. Now, when we go to phyto, sorry, phytoplankton <clears throat> is spelt incorrectly, but when we go to the pyramid of numbers, there are quantitatively more zooplankton than there are phytoplankton. Um, and because there are more zooplankton than phytoplankton, they also weigh more than the phytoplankton. But because there is such a disproportionate amount of energy transferred, it doesn't matter if this is an inverted pyramid, its pyramid of energy will still be shaped like a normal pyramid, okay? All right, so that is it for that lesson. Um, I know I only did one lesson this week, but like I've mentioned before, there's only seven for ecology and they're all quite long like this. So I'm going to intersperse it with different assignments throughout the week, um, especially if we don't go back to school until the end of the year and Mr. Van Emmel is doing the climate change section. <laughs> I don't want to be just done in a week, right? There's lots that we can do with this unit, including um, a possible create it yourself from scratch lab that I might do if I am done with a few weeks to spare. Okay. All right, everybody, have a great day. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Stay safe, wash your hands, you know, and hopefully I will see you again on Monday for some trivia on this lesson. Okay. Goodbye, everybody.